Good afternoon, George. Happy solar eclipse. Happy birthday. I'm glad you're now drinking age. And today we have a phenomenal guest with us, a classmate of medical school from the Rogo years in Romania. Take it yes. over. Yes, uh, my dear friend, Dr. Kalin Drumbaran. We went to medical school together back in the day, really back in the day. And his topic of discussion is going to be around about anesthesia and the maternity hospital. It worked well until it didn't. So take it away. So Dr. Kalin graduated from medical school with Dr. George and Dele Rogo in Romania. He followed his passion as his father's footsteps as his father is in OB in Romania to a career in obstetric anesthesia until the hospital could no longer support the level of care anesthesia and neonatal medicine gave us there. Welcome to the show, Colleen. It's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you. I'm uh, honored to be invited on your uh, podcast. Thank you. Colleen, why not pediatrics? Well, it's hard to say. So when I first started my training in the United States, I started with family practice. So I got to get introduction, introduction different fields of medicine or practice here, which is a little different from uh, way back in Romania. And um, I was attracted by the intensity of anesthesia. Uh, so uh, I decided to um, to do anesthesiology. And while doing anesthesiology, I decided to uh, specialize in obstetric anesthesia. Now, your, your father was an obstetrician in Romania. Or I, I imagine he's retired at this point. Right, he is. He retired about 15 years ago. And we many times disagreed on the way things are done in obstetrics. He believed that a well-conducted labor by the obstetrician is so comfortable that the woman doesn't even need an epidural for labor, which opinion with which I strongly disagree. And I mm-hmm. assume most women. So about 70% of, of pediatricians are women. So I'm sure that on this show, he would not be a welcome guest in that regard. And right. did, did you do many deliveries with your dad in Romania? So actually, I didn't do any deliveries with my dad in Romania. I rotated through his hospital as a medical student. I saw him work, but it wasn't a co-working relationship. It was medical student and full-fledged doctor relationship. So no, we actually did not work together. Oh. Did you think you would be an obstetrician when you were going through, like before you entered medical school and, and while you were in medical school in Romania? No, I when I entered medical school, I didn't know what specialty I wanted to do. And I had no idea what I'll be doing. As I progressed through medical school, I was attracted by the pro- more procedure intense fields. I considered being a surgeon and actually the few months that I worked in Romania before I left for the United States, I was in a surgical program. Yeah. How was it when you came to the United States in those days? You had a study? Uh, honestly, yes. it was a big shock. It was a big yeah. shock, cultural and other, a lot of other aspects. But I enjoyed the change. Yeah. It was very exciting. Yeah, back did, in did those you... days, Herb, you don't know this story, but Kalina and I were in the same class, right? It was a funny story. I got to tell this, Kalin. I've told it before. <laughs> Where he came in, he actually did three years of pediatrics. The, the medical school what? was general meds and, and the pediatric medicine. It was like its own medical school. There are so two I, different tracks, yes. Yeah. So he was on a pediatric track, right? And uh, in the third year, he transferred into medicine. So there's this beginning. We were. I remember it was uh, a surgical class that we were learning. And it was like in those big old school amphitheaters with the, the big wooden desk and the chairs and just going up like in the movies in the 50s yeah. Colleen was all the way in the top row and I was all the way at the bottom that's how I met him and so you had this professor that's giving this lecture about surgery and the guy is reading word for word from his notes word for word it was like so boring and then he went out for a lo- lot he took a break and he went out of the room for a little bit there goes Colleen from the top row stepping on the desk all the way down to the podium takes the guy's papers, mixes them all up, and climbs back up to the top row where he couldn't be incriminated. I can see he could have done that. And I said, oh, boy, that's a cool guy. I got to meet this guy. 
That's and how and where, where, where was Dr. Rogu Deli at Rogu in that? She was next to me. We all were like in the same clique. So that's where we all became friends with him. And she didn't participate in the note changing. No, we were good students. And the guy came back <laughs> and then he started reading, right? He started reading from the thing and it didn't make any medical sense. And then he got all agitated. He just stormed out and, and sent everybody home. Did you ever get in trouble for that? You probably should have. No, why do you snitch? You know, yeah. in a communist country, communist regime, that probably could have been grounds for expulsion. Or hanging in the backyard. <laughs> and whipping. <laughs> that was pretty cool. That's pretty and, uh, We all became friends after that. Now, you see what it takes to become friends with Dr. Rogo. <laughs> I've only done it for two years. You've done it for more than two years. And I'm already in a couple of psych meds. So <laughs> I'm very I'm very resilient. I'm very resilient. I'm All right, a keep, going. keep going. Uh, so, did, were you also a guest in the Rogo basement? No, I was in the basement next door. Next door. We actually yeah. we came back from medical school. So Delia and I came back first. And you know, we explained to the children that you guys were married already when you were living in the basement. Yes, we were living in a basement together because we were married. He was okay. single. I get a phone call from this guy, Colleen, that I went to school with, and he's down at the Queen Santa Mall if I could pick him up. So I went and picked him up. He hung out. We had a place to stay, and, and then we studied together. Remember, we used to go to Queen's College Library and study every yeah. single day? Yeah. And yeah. remember the day when we both passed the USMLE, we were like wetting in our pants to open up that envelope of the results. <laughs> he opened mine, and I opened his. Oh, how funny. Both best. Oh, my goodness. How did you have a phone number to reach him back then? There were no cell phones. You right, know, only landlines. Oh, yeah. Only yeah. landlines. How did you have the number? So I somehow, I think we wrote to each other and I asked for his phone number. And that's yeah. that's how things ha have happened in the olden days. Yeah, it was like paper. Uh, yeah. Do you guys remember the phone books at the airports? Sometimes oh, yeah. when I would be traveling... Like I'd be, I would be in New York and I'd be like, oh, I wonder if I can find Ro George Rogu. And I looked through the, for the phone books on, in the airport while I was waiting for my layover, find the number, go to the public phone, drop my quarter and call the person's house and say, Hey, it's Herb. Is this you or George? <laughs> I don't know how we survived without cell phones. I know. It's a whole different world. Mm -hmm. So what funny stories do you have about George and Delia? Colleen. I remember that George was the coolest student in the year and because oh, yeah. he was driving the coolest car in town. He had a two-door Renault car, Renault Fuego, that was really hot. And he was quite a guy with that car. He oh, had, yeah. Everybody knew him, yeah. What was the Renault Fuego look like? It was like a two-door sports car. Yeah, hatchback. Hatchback. was it bare bones? Because in Colombia they had something called Renault Four, which was just similar I mean, to that, a little bit more sporty than that. A little bit more sporty than that. Yeah, it it uh, was quite a looker. It was I don't know how the engine was, but the design was, was really cool. It was terrible. Do you remember how many CCs? It's probably a four cylinder engine, like twelve hundred or fourteen hundred CCs. They're very small. Uh, I don't remember. How many hamburgers did you guys smuggle into Romania? He wasn't the one. <laughs> he wasn't the guy. He wasn't involved in the smuggling. Right, let's go back to the medical part. This is more fun. So then after you came to, to North America, you passed the, back then they were called the FMGs, right? Yes. Actually, yes. I passed the USMLE, I think, or both. I, I think we, I did, we were a generation was, where you did both. It, it was yeah, during the transition, both. yeah. 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 And then did you do a, a transitional internship in America before going to anesthesia? I started a residency in family medicine and came late into the system, the match, and I, I started whatever I could, whatever position I could. And after a year, after I got actually, it was a lucky way to start my career in medicine doing family practice because I got to see the major specialties actually do them a little bit as a resident and uh, I decided to pursue anesthesia which was perfect because in anesthesiology you need a base clinical year of either medicine, surgery, obstetrics or pediatrics 
And just after that, you, you start studying anesthesiology. So it worked perfectly. And I, I, after my first year of family practice in Queens, New York, I started my residency in anesthesiology on uh, Long Island, Stony Brook. And you know, after that, for the residency, I decided to do a fellowship in obstetric anesthesia in uh, Manhattan, New York. Uh, so that's how it happened. And I don't know anything about obstetric anesthesia, but is it mostly epidurals and being prepared for the emergency C-sections? So obstetric anesthesia is focused on the pregnant mother and the baby. So to me, it's, it looked like a very happy field. The vast majority of the time, you deal with happy outcomes. Everybody's happy. I, I liked that. Yes. So basically, when you do obstetric anesthesia, you deal with two patients, the mother and the fetus, soon to become a baby. And you're concerned about the well-being of both of them. And as I said, most of the time, there are happy outcomes. And it's very rewarding to be involved in the, the process of bringing a, a baby to the world. But then you have two huge egos, the obstetrician and the neonatologist. So once, so many times, yes, the neonatologist could be involved even before the birth. Most of the time when you expect a healthy baby, the pediatricians are there for a cursory assessment. But uh, many times if you deal with complications, prenatal complications, the neonatal team, team uh, will be involved even before but yes, I did have I did have a lot of contact with the neonatologists even during my training, and also where I worked for twenty four or five years at Women Infants Hospital in Providence. It's very intense, but as I said, I found it very rewarding. Is there because from a pediatrics, most general pediatricians now we don't attend C sections or routine deliveries, or a lot of us aren't even welcome in the nurseries anymore. But is there a lot of liability as an anesthesiologist? If there's a bad outcome, the OB, the neonatal team gets sued. Did you get named in the suit, Stu, or did they leave you out of it? Luckily, I wasn't named in any suits regarding deliveries, and I consider myself lucky because, unfortunately, as you probably know, maternal mortality hasn't changed in 20 or 30 years. So medicine has made a lot of progress in a lot of areas. Anesthesiology particularly became safer and safer. But in terms of maternal mortality, hasn't changed in a lot of time. So in a lot of years... So there are still bad outcomes, unfortunately. A lot of them, we don't know why they still happen, like preeclampsia, eclampsia, maternal bleeding around the birth. But luckily, I haven't been involved in any lawsuits or I've been involved in cases that didn't end up well, but they weren't because of medical negligence. It was just bad luck. Yeah, I just read the other day that in Chicago, a, mo a mother who had a placenta tore, right? And the baby um, had some birth injuries. She just gained, but she just got a settlement. The baby eventually died at four years of age. She just got a settlement for $14 million from the University of Chicago. $14 million. Wow. That's uh, a lot. Yeah. That's, as I said, there are still bad outcomes, unfortunately, with. Uh, maternal bleeding, but luckily I wasn't involved in any no liability. Yeah, I see that you, you have the optimistic obstetrician genes in you. The birthing of a baby is a miracle. It's the beginning of a new life. It's such a happy time. I have the pediatrician risk adverse gene in me, which is one of these is going to blow up. It's going to be a terrible outcome. And I don't want to be in the room when it happens. Because to me, OB was very stressful. I delivered 60 babies in Costa Rica. But it was very stressful because any given second, for no good reason, things go bad. And you just happen to you're, be the one that, being there. You're totally correct. It's a numbers game. And I, was, I worked as an attending at a very busy obstetric hospital. And unfortunately, because it was also a referral uh, center for uh, pregnancies with progress, either pregnancies with problems, or uh, fetal problems because the hospital has a very, very good NICU. So I did see a lot of uh, problems happening. And uh, I was warned before I chose the, the specialty that it's going to be a high-risk specialty. But 
you're right, probably I was optimistic. I still chose to pursue this path, but yes, you do see a lot of problems. Yeah. Did it, did it, we talk a lot about burnout. Did it, was it hard emotionally to see bad outcomes? It is always hard emotionally to see bad outcomes. It's heartbreaking. I don't think I got burnt out because of that, but it takes a toll emotionally when you see bad outcomes. Yeah, it's very hard. It's a dream, right? I, I talk about this a lot. I admire women tremendously. They have a dream. They have to find a partner. They get pregnant. They endure nine months of pregnancy. And they go into the delivery room with the hope that they're going to have this baby. And then sometimes they've been dreaming about since they were 12 year old girls. And then something doesn't go right. Um, and it has to be devastating. The emotional has to be devastating. Very hard to witness. You were at a really large maternal hospital and it only did maternity, right? We did the obstetrics and the gynecology, yes. And I think you told me when we had dinner together that you guys did over 10,000 deliveries a year. When I started around 2000, we were doing about 10,000 deliveries. The late, the latest years, it came down to 75, 8,000 deliveries a year. Wow. So over 25 years, the number of deliveries came down a little, but still it's a very busy place. A lot of deliveries. It's a ton of deliveries. And how often were you on call? On average, once a week. Okay. And how big was the anesthesia team then? The doctors at the peak of the department were about 11, 11 doctors that did obstetrics. And when you were on call, you didn't sleep? If you got to sleep three hours in a row, that happened maybe three times a row, three times in a year. It was very busy. So the nights over there are expected to be busy. And then as the landscape of maternal fetal medicine changed, and mostly it's been a change of 50% of the, 40% expectant mothers in the U.S. are covered by Medicaid, and we're having less babies. So your volume dropped and the revenue for the hospital started dropping. And then they weren't able to afford the anesthesia. And I think you told me over dinner, even towards the later years, the level four NICU was having some trouble staying in the black? There's a very uh, large NICU department. It got, it, it started being big from when I joined in 1998. It used to be a very antiquated NICU. They had 60 bassinates in two large rooms and very busy. And they realized it's, it cannot go like that. And about 15 years ago, they built a new wing and they built it with 80 rooms for babies. So 80, maybe not 80 rooms, but 80 spots because they're twins, triplets, but they had 80 spots for, for babies spread on two floors. So it became suddenly a very modern unit. And it used to be always in the black, always a money maker for the hospital. They were very good. I think the only thing that couldn't have been done here in Providence in conjunction with our neighboring hospital, Hasbro Children's Hospital. The only thing that couldn't have been done here was ECMO. Aside from ECMO, I think they were handling almost everything for, for the neonates. And as I said, it used to be always re, re, reliable in the black. But after the pandemic, when they actually turned out to be uh, busier than usual, they realized that the payer mix uh, for the NICU changed. And um, even that got, they got, I think, maybe 20% busier than usual. I think, though, that they, the Medicaid-insured babies, the percentage of Medicaid-insured Medicaid babies went up, and they suddenly started uh, losing money in spite of being busier. Wow. That sounds familiar. Yeah. That's a struggle we have in pediatrics yeah. all, all over the place. But it's affecting also maternity, obstetricians, anesthesiologists take care of expectant mothers, maternity hospitals. There's a bunch of maternity hospitals closing around the country because they cannot maintain the doors open with the payer mix. That must have been very sad for you after so many years of dedication to the institution and to delivering the babies to come to a point where 
it was no longer something that you wanted to do? Actually, that was a different issue. It was partially, it was the insurance reimbursement for our group. We were an independent group. We were hired by the hostel. We're totally a private group. But what happened is, I think it's related to the bigger changes in um, the mindset of the New York physicians. As we mentioned before, our nights were very busy, always expected to work. And we had trouble attracting new physicians as the original member, original members of the group started retiring. We had trouble attracting new physicians who did not want to spend all their nights up doing obstetrics. In anesthesiology, obstetrics is not one of the fields that attracts people easily. Usually a hospital like the one where I work is part of a bigger hospital and the pain of being in, in obstetrics gets shared in a, among a bigger anesthesiology group. But here we're this small group that we're only doing obstetrics and gynecology and each night that you're on call. You had to do epidurals and be up all night. And actually, for the last several years, we had anesthesiology residents from the hostel next door, the big old hospital, Rhode Island Hostel, and they were rotating through obstetrics. They found it very interesting. They liked it, but none, we weren't able to attract any of them because none of them liked it that much to commit to doing that much obstetric anesthesia. So it was... The problem that I think it's all over medicine, people expect to have a, a better life balance. They don't want to work nights and they don't want to work as intensely during the night. Sometimes it doesn't matter the pay, they still want a, a better a life balance. So that the reimbursement that wasn't keeping up with the needs was one problem, but also attracting people willing to work that hard. No matter the income was another issue that led to our group disintegrating. But you had a very well organized group, right? You had your own nurses you hired to do all the work. Right. Everything was so, extremely efficient. For a while, we didn't even realize uh, that we're so special. But towards the end, we hired a consulting group to uh, look at our business and medical model. And <clears throat> And uh, yes, in order to be very efficient, we, on average, we probably had 25 deliveries in 24 hours. They could happen at all times. And sometimes you had hours that nothing happened. And then you had that stretch when four or five mothers requested an epidural within whatever, half an hour. And you had to deal with cesarean sections, scheduled or not. So things had to move really fast. And being a private group, we extolled at what we do. And we got very organized on our little, little specialty. So yes, we did have our own nurses that talked to the patients before, screened them, and they were able to present us even before we spoke with the patient with a good clinical picture of the mother. And things were working very smoothly and efficient. So probably an epidural was done within minutes of asking, and the actual placing it took also really short time because we were very specialized and all of my uh, partners were doing only this for such a long time. Everybody was very good at that, what they were doing. It, it reminds me of a model that I um, looked at 20 years ago. There's a hospital in Canada that only does inguinal hernias. And the whole team is focused on inguinal hernias and everybody does they work the same way and they have some of the best outcomes in the world because the surgeons follow the same procedure, anesthesia follows the same procedure, the post-op recovery is the same. And interestingly, they keep them like in a hotel for two weeks after the inguinal hernia repair because they found out that the problem is people don't get up uh, fast enough and then that's where they get the complications. So it's not a hospital, but they have people there to get you up and manage your pain for the first two weeks, and then they send you home. Sounds like you had done the same thing, just the same procedures over and over again until you become super great at it. And the outcome. So we got very, great. right. We were very specialized at what we're doing. We must have lost other skills, but we sharpened the ones we had. And I think the complication level, complication incidents was very small in our group. So you were a desirable group. It seems. Why didn't the why didn't the hospital want to keep you guys happy? 
so the hostel wanted to keep us happy, but it was difficult because we couldn't, as we from 11, we ended up being six because of the retirements and the inability to bring in new people. And at some point we told the hostel, we, we aren't able to attract anybody because nobody wants to do this kind of work that much. And they supported us for a while financially, but still it was enough to attract anybody. And then at some point we said, we cannot do it that we cannot continue doing it like this. And the hostel actually worked with us to bring some other group in. And the group for ne- next, the hostel next door, bigger hospital, I think the group was about 50 anesthesiologists, came in and they took over and they brought in new people who weren't necessarily that excited to, to come and do obstetrics. But as I said, being a bigger group, each one's turn to do obstetrics came a lot less often. Plus, that group was an employed group. They're all employees, and they were told, okay, now you have to do that. They didn't have a choice. So that's what happened. Hmm. Now, you shared with us over dinner in uh, Boca that you, at the towards the end of your stint, you had anesthesia residents. That's correct, yes. And it, it just stayed in my mind that you share two things. One, that you would tell your nursing staff for a certain case, do not wake up the resident, wake me up because it's going to be a disaster. No, after midnight, I've told the nurses not to call the resident because whenever you try to teach to do an epidural, it takes one epidural can take 20 minutes, half an hour, and it's some depending on the residence it could be painful even to watch so <laughs> after midnight i did not have the patience of watching a fresh resident trying to do an epidural on an uncomfortable mother probably eight centimeters dilated to midnight i have just did that myself in a very efficient and quick way and everybody was happy so my my teaching wasn't that that good after midnight I, nobody had the patience for it everybody was happy with that decision Wow. And then so different from the way I was trained, right? After 6 p.m., all the attendings left and the interns and residents had to wing it. And there was no one else in the building. So we, you know, you have to supervise residents uh, whenever they do some teaching is, I think it's a passion, is a gift and takes dedication. Maybe I didn't have those qualities after midnight. <clears throat> So it was, I have to say, it was maybe selfish too for my my own good also, because as I said, it's painful to watch somebody at 3 a.m. taking 20 minutes to do something that you can do in five minutes. My my patience wasn't the same at 3 a.m. in the morning. I don't think anybody's is. And, and then you had another observation, which is very interesting. You said that the new anesthesia residents, social skills, where not they they were not up to speed that so i don't know i don't know i i've made that uh, observation and i don't know if uh, it was this program in particular a lot of the residents were nice people nice personalities but i encountered some really odd personalities which you never knew what's what's going on behind their eyes and there it wasn't a medical issue they were just funny personalities, funny, not in a good way. They're like odd social being. being. Like Elon Musk. Genius at what they do, but... Maybe there are geniuses that didn't perspire through, but uh, I quite a few of them, and to me it seemed like maybe there were more than in other specialties, but there were, yes, odd personalities. I don't know if uh, the specialty attracts these personalities or it was just the luck of the draw in this program, but some of them were, uh, yeah, odd personalities. But really, don't you think that it's self-selecting? So for example, I would think that if you're going to radiology, it's because you don't really want to talk to a lot of people. You like the dark room. So for me, it's hard to say. It's definitely probably, it's a a degree of self-selection probably, but I don't know. I don't remember my fellow residents when I trained to be that odd, but also it's a different experience. When you're a resident, you, you experience your colleagues in a horizontal way. 
when you're in a supervising position, you think it's different from above. So I don't know if, if my experience as a resident myself was different, the people who were different at the time or now, they're, I, I don't know what the right answer is. Well, I, I found that um, observation fascinating because I think George, and I don't know, I don't want to speak for George, but I think I, I see it in the exam room to, today. Parents come in and they won't, it's not even the kids, the parents won't drop their cell phone to talk about what's going on with their kid. And I feel like an old man, please put your cell phone away so that we can have a conversation. Because what's the purpose of bringing your kid if you're going to be texting and looking at pictures on Instagram while we're talking about your kid's health? And they look at me like, I have to put my cell phone away. Yeah, that's what people do. They When they go out to dinner, they put their cell phones away. When they go talk to their lawyer, they put their cell phones away. When they go talk to their accountant, they put their cell phones away. When they come in to talk to the doctor, they put their cell phones away. So we can use the time to have a conversation and meet your needs. So maybe it's just generational. Could be. Actually, I sometimes I watch my coworkers, you go into the break room, there are a bunch of them and all of them are on their phones. Doesn't matter the age. It's like you deal with a bunch of grown up teenagers, all of them on their phones. I don't know if it's a generation or it's the times. Yeah. I think it's the times. Do you see that in the exam room, George, where people are just, their noses are on the phone? It's unfortunately has become all a transactional thing. I'm here to get something from you, a prescription, a shot, a letter, a something. Yeah. And we become like the inconvenience to them because we're in the way of their thing. But I think it's also starting with like, I, I we have the medical students, right? When they yeah. start the rotation, they are, I can get them trained on the EHR within a matter of one hour. They're so good at this. They're really good at the computer stuff. They're really good at technology and things. But they're really all bad at the beginning, at the doctor thing, the talking, the relationship with the people. So after I get them live on the computer, I tell them, leave the computer, talk to people, look at the people, engage with the people, write later. By the end of the month, they actually get it. Do they carry this on moving forward? I don't know. They graduate, but hopefully they will. Actually, what I noticed by working with residents for the last several years of my career is I realized that you can teach skills, but you cannot teach personality. And if I was looking to hire somebody, I think probably the personality, the ability to interact socially was the first thing that I was looking for. And the skills, as I said, I think I can teach somebody something. Yes. But, but it's harder to teach them to interact with other people. So I, I think that showing up is wins the game. And then the attitude with which you show up is what wins the game. Like you said, all the other skills can be taught. But if you don't show up to work, you know, there's, there's no way. And if you show right, up... The, that, the, the attitude, it cannot be taught. It has to be yeah. to come from within. Yeah. Showing up and having a great attitude is what wins the game. And I don't think that lesson is being taught in K through 12 colleges or medical schools. And so we don't get, we get people that are very smart, but don't want to show up to work and they don't have the right attitude. Blame it on COVID. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but COVID was three years out of our existence. So what else do you want to share with our audience, Killing, You've been very generous with your time today. I don't know. What does the audience want to know? Is well, anesthesia still a cool profession? Because when you started, I remember back then, you got into family medicine, family practice. And that was the hot career at that time. It was just the beginning. Yeah. yeah. And then you flipped to anesthesia. And that was the time when anesthesia was like, nobody wanted to touch anesthesia. But then it started to shoot back up again. Medicine changes every 10, 15 years. Something becomes fashionable. So anesthesia seems to be very fashionable now. I wonder why. Because a lot of the students 
are going into anesthesia. Most of them are. I think what's going on is the times, right? So people, even in medicine, I feel like they want to have a workload that they know when it starts, when it ends. And once they hang their white coat up for the day, they want to be done and put work, leave work behind them. And anesthesiology, to a certain degree, offers that. Once you're done with your operating room duties or whatever you do, intensive care, usually you're done. And I look at the doctors around me. When I started, there were quite a few of the independent obstetricians by themselves or just one partner. And they were available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And as years passed, uh, all these practices disappeared. All these independent uh, obstetricians either became part of the really large groups or they were bought up by the hospital. And uh, just before I stopped working at Women Infants, I think there was only one old timer who was practicing the old fashioned way by himself, making himself available all the time. So I think it's a change of mentality in the younger doctors. They are now willing to be available 24 seven. They want better work life balance. And they, I think they find that they can do that in anesthesiology. There is a lot of patient surgery going on. And once the surgery center closes, everybody's done. And as I said, they leave the work behind. The work cannot catch up with them afterwards. Yeah. And everybody loves the guy or the gal who stops your pain. And that's why I said, that's why I've told you at at some point that I found that uh, the specialty of surgical anesthesia being very rewarding. Once you you make somebody happy within minutes, and then most of the time there is a good outcome with the entire family is happy, welcoming the new baby. So that part of it, I think it's still there. Yeah, it's wonderful to solve somebody's pain. This is a really great feeling. It's instant gratification. But also the anesthesiologist, unless they're in a pain clinic, they don't have to hire staff and front desk and office managers and have this huge business operation that the family practitioner, the pediatrician, the obstetrician, the dermatologist has to have, which never stops. You can stop seeing the patients not be on call, but you're still worrying about how the bills are going to get paid, how if the cleaning crew got in there, Susie Q is unhappy and she's going to quit the front desk position. All those things. But that's, I think that's, these things are across all, all specialties. As I said, I think in anesthesiology, most of the anesthesiologists are part of huge groups or are hired by the hospital. But I think that's happening across all the specialties. The independent practitioner or small group doctor group are disappearing and they're becoming more corporate. And you'd have to deal with those issues less and less than ones you mentioned, like front desk, whoever is cleaning, whoever is answering the phones. I think across all fields of medicine, things are changing. Yeah. And the money's not bad for a starting anesthesiologist. I, I, but before COVID, this just really opened my eyes to what you're talking about, about quality of life. One of the pediatrician's son finished radiology. And radiologists make a lot of money. But like you said, he wanted to be only outpatient, not hospital-based. And he was willing to be employed. Start If, you, if you're hospital-based, you're willing to take call. You do some procedures, uh, radiologists starting at half a million. He was willing to work for 350 Monday through Friday with four weeks vacation a year. No partnership track because he works for a big health system. But no weekends, no nights, very limited call. And he's, that's plenty of money. I don't need to work for a hospital and have to be on call and have to go out and do a procedure and deal with all of that. 350 is plenty of money. And it's a Monday to Friday job, and I'm done reading CT scans all day. And I think some anesthesiologist graduates feel the same way. I'll go to the right. Outpatient. That's that's the same everywhere. The outpatient surgical center do cases from seven a.m. till three Monday through Friday, and I'm done. No what, call, what about no this? this? What about the, this uh, CRNA business? How does that work with anesthesiology? It's the CRNAs are becoming more and more prevalent, and I 
I found that their pay went up more than doctors. Many times you find their pay for the CRNA not being that far below of for the, the doctor would be paid. And depending on where you work, CRNAs could actually work independent. And it's a changing, it's a changing specialty also. When I started, I didn't work with that many CRNAs, but uh, I think they're becoming more and more uh, sought after. There's a little bit of saving by being paid less. And the hostlers or the men, whoever is hiring them, they, they want the saving. And plus, in anesthesiology, there is a little bit of a shortage of personnel. So when you cannot have doctors, you use CRNAs. That's a little bit of a saving, not as much as it used to be, but it is. And some states, as, as I mentioned, started to allow the CRNAs to work uh, by themselves without uh, anesthesiologist supervision. So when things go bad, who do they call if they work by themselves? They're the end of the road. The buck stops with somebody. So that's a decision that's hopefully considered before. But sometimes if you don't have a CRNA, you cannot operate a small surgery center. So you have to pick your poison. There are things that if you don't have a body, doesn't matter who, you cannot do. A lot of CRNAs work in eye centers or do cataracts and they only do sedation or colonoscopy centers. But it's sometimes they would like to have a doctor, but they cannot. Or some sometimes it's a decision that it's very well informed and decide to save a lot of money and hire the CRNA. But it's complex. It's a complex decision. Yeah. Now I have a good question. And maybe we can close with this. I don't know if I have a good enough. I don't know if I have a good enough. All right, we'll do your question first, Herb. Before you go there, back in nineteen ninety nine, back in nineteen ninety two, yeah, to ninety five, I worked in a rural hospital in Virginia. It was only a forty bed hospital. I was the only pediatrician, and they did have a, two general surgeons and a visiting ENT and uh, orthopedic surgeon, and they could not afford to have a uh, anesthesiologist. So they used a CRNA, two of them. And the way it works in Virginia, they were under the supervision of the surgeon. So if something went wrong, the surgeon's responsible for their care. But it's just such a small community that there's just no way they would have ever been able to recruit an anesthesiologist to do the work. And then in Chicago, at Rush is a huge department, huge anesthesia department. They already use CRNAs and they had a residency program, but they had a rule that every induction and when they woke up the patient, the anesthesiologist was in the room. So the, the CRNAs cases were the more simple cases and they were just doing the documentation and the anesthesiologists were around to come in if a complication came in, but nobody got induced without an anesthesiologist at the bedside. Um, that's usually the rule in, in the bigger places. And that seemed to work okay because anesthesia is like 99% of boredom. You can be trade dangerous if you want, and then 1% of sheer hell. Yeah. Everything goes nuts in one second. And that's the value of the anesthesiology is that 1% that everything goes bad in one second. And you better hope that there's a really good anesthesiologist at your bedside when that happens because that will make the difference between your life or you being dead. There's a lot of just charting. Yeah. Patients sleep, surgeons doing this thing, come back when you need to be woken up. Yeah. Colleen, let's go back to 1993. If it was 1993 again, pre-match, mm -hmm. would you pick anesthesiology once again, knowing what you know? So personally, I have I had a good run and I would probably do it all over again. That's what I thought. Good answer. Probably a lot of kids are listening to this, and I'm happy you would say that because a lot of people I've seen, after they've had a good run in their career, they say to young doctors, don't do pediatrics. Don't do this because it's terrible. Don't do that. Don't do that. And it puts a little damper on the outlook of young physicians. So I'm glad you said you would do it again. I I like I still like what I do. And with all the downsides, I think I, I made a good choice 30 years ago. Yep. It was a pleasure. Same here, doctors. 
Well, it's yeah. great to see you. I hope it warms up a little bit in Rhode Island. Yeah. Hopefully, you'll come over this summer. For... Yeah, we'll go visit Colleen. Yeah, I'd love to be on one of those boats. <laughs> sure. There's a lot of room. So let's, yeah, George, let us know when you want to come and bring Herb with you. Or oh, Herb, you can come us. on your own. You can come on your own, Herb. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Definitely make it as this, this summer trip. Summers are awesome in Rhode Island. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Shut it off. It's great to see you. Give my regard to your children and to Andrea. Thank you. Happy yeah. birthday. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Nice, nice talking to you, Herb. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, Oh, let's see where.